thank you, Corey and Corey, for uh, getting us started. Um, I'm delighted to have Umut Korkut on campus today, and uh, and particularly delighted to see so many of you here. Uh, it, I think he knows that it's the last couple of days of the semester, and we all know in an academic setting what that means and how many how little sleep everybody's running on. So I, I think it's probably a testimony also to the popularity of immigration as a topic when. I give students an option on what topics to write about in my classes. They often will pick immigration topics because um, it's something that we all think about at some level. And um, I'm grateful to um, Umut Korkut for posing this interesting puzzle to us today, which is why would you have anti-immigration politics in two countries that traditionally have had very few, and indeed today have very few, immigrants in them? Uh, and I think the answers to that question are big and important ones. Um, Umut Korkut is a lecturer, associate professor of political science at uh, Glasgow Caledonian University. Did his uh, doctoral work at the Central European University in Budapest, Hungary, and uh, he's a native of Istanbul, Turkey. Um, uh, his most recent books, for which I need my cheat sheet, are Liberalization Challenges in Hungary, Elitism, Progressivism, and Populism. That's a 2012 book from Palgrave. And then also the Discourses and Politics of Migration in Europe, uh, also from Paul Grave in the NYU European Politics Series. Um, he's a scholar with a wide range of interests. He's currently doing a, an, an interesting project he was telling me about last night at dinner of, on, on mosque sermons in Turkey and the construction, construction of masculinity and femininity during mosque sermons. So the analog would be, what do you learn about being a man or a woman from sacrament meeting talks? And so he's got... He's got uh, mm -hmm. Uh, hundreds of these mosque sermons that he's been investigating and is currently writing up a book project on that. He's luck we're lucky to have him. He's in Los Angeles for another speaking engagement, so we saw a chance to bring him to BYU. So please join me in welcoming to BYU Umut Korkut. Hello, everyone. Thanks for the turn up. Um, thank you for the invitation, uh, Wade and Corey, and especially the Candace Center for having me here today. I recently made the trip from Istanbul to Los Angeles direct flight for 14 hours, and then I flew here for an, uh, another one hour and a half, um, but it's highly rewarding to be here, so I quite enjoy myself, and thanks very much for the hospitality. Now, why do I talk about this thing? I mean, and especially these two countries, which are quite far, but at the same time make quite sense, you know, to understand the rest of, uh, rest of the world. Well, I'm a native of, of, of Turkey, um, but I lived too long, let's say, seven years or so in, in Hungary. And in, I've been a foreigner. I started as a foreigner in Hungary, but you know, all, all, all throughout these years, it became home to me. But at the same time, I kept Turkey as my home. But at the moment, I'm a total foreigner, and I work in Scotland. Um, being a foreigner in so many different contexts obviously started to raise certain questions in my mind. So how come you know, in, in one context where there are quite a few foreigners, such as the UK, United Kingdom, uh, immigration is very much debated, but in other contexts where you know, the number number of foreigners is not all that high, um, but uh, you know, immigration to Turkey and Hungary in comparison to Britain is quite low. Uh, as a matter of fact, how come people people have aversion? aversion? Uh, they are rather disturbed, in fact, with receiving foreigners. Now, um, I try to bring together, you know, what people think, uh, what what public feel about having foreigners among themselves, as well as policies that, um, you know, very very popular parties, uh, such as the Fidesz, the Alliance of Young Democrats in Hungary, as well as AKP, you know, the uh, Just uh, Just and Development Party in Turkey, have been developing. So, I mean, hereby, this is uh, the talk pretty much based on an article that's coming out uh, as a part of a special issue in comparative European politics in 2015. But here you're going to have an, an earlier view of this, uh, this article. I hope you enjoy it. And thanks very much for the turn up, by the way. I know that this is the last uh, week of the semester, but hopefully you will enjoy it. OK, now let's start. Um, here you go. I mean, this is practically very much of an outline of my talk. I'm going to introduce you to the migration myth in these countries in, in the absence of migrants, and then I'm going to pose a couple of research questions. I will go into detail as to why I pick Hungary and Turkey, which may appear to be quite distant from each other, but as we, as we get into the uh, 
uh, the details of the paper, you'll see that they relate to each other. And two very important conservative parties. Fidesz is the, is, is the biggest uh, conservative Democrats in the EU, and AKP has the most established conservative Democratic Party in the whole of Europe. I mean, AKP has been in power for 11 years by now. They won practically two elections, one after, well, three elections, one after another. And it, it looks very likely that these two, th these two parties are very popular uh, in, in Hungary and, and Turkey, and they are there to stay. And then I'm going to introduce practically public opinion, you know, based on different surveys on immigration from the Hungarian and Turkish cases, so that you can understand what the public, what the public feel about immigration in the absence of immigrants per se. And then finally, I'm going to introduce the immigration frames that both the public and the politicians have been building around, you know, once again, uh, these absent immigrants. And finally, we're going to have the conclusion. Now, what is the migration myth? I mean, let's have a look at the, the, the numbers first. Uh, according to 2010 International Organization for Migration, IOM statistics, uh, what we see is in Turkey at the moment, it's only 1.9% of the population that is immigrant. And in Turkey, this is, uh, sorry, in Hungary, this is a bit higher. It, it stands at 3.7%, but this includes the European Economic Area Nationals and very much uh, the Hungarian ethnics. Uh, you may know that uh, Hungary has quite a lot of ethnics that, that, that were left out of Hungary after the First World War. So we're talking about you know, two, two and a half million Hungarian ethnics living around. And since 2011, as a result of the, the change in the citizenship, these people, they can gain Hungarian citizenship almost automatically, and they can move. So when we look at the composition of these, you know, even these very, very small numbers, in fact, what we realize is very much so that, I mean, these people, they, they either belong religiously or ethnically to the whole society. So not even that 1.9 or 3% or 3.7% per se, they come from very different or divergent backgrounds. All right, so what is this migration myth then? Um, let's see. The extent of xenophonic, xenophobic feelings within the Hungarian or Turkish population is, is quite inbred, it's quite deep, such that in Hungary, in, in a survey in, uh, from 2012, only 11% of the respondents, they call, them, they call themselves xenophile. So they, you know, they, 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 they mentioned that they are ready or they are ready to welcome or accept foreigners. In Turkey, uh, we see that uh, the more religious the people are, the, the less they are ready to accept migrants to, to come to their countries. Now, why is that the case? As I'm going to discuss later, this is very much of an expression of the Turkish public opinion aversion, uh, unacceptance towards differences. And this uh, shows itself mostly, manifests itself mostly uh, among the religious, such that 72% of those that call themselves religious state that immigration rate in, the, in their country has reached the level of disturbance. This is quite important as well. I mean, not only that they are not xenophobic, but they also say that they're quite disturbed with the level of immigrants in their countries. Now, the anti-immigrant feelings that increase in these societies in parallel to the general feeling of aversion towards you know, religious, ethnic, and cultural differences. So not only that these societies are quite aversive towards foreigners, but also they're aversive internally to those that are ethnically, religiously, or culturally different than uh, the, the majority, at least this is the perception of the public. So in this case, rather than the number of immigrants settled in, in a country, the public rejection of politic, uh, of, uh, of, and you know, obviously the politicians' objections to all sorts of differences substantiate anti-immigrant immigration policies. And hence, the numbers, they don't make sense any longer. It is just the feeling that the public feels towards differences and then how the politicians negotiate their policies vis-a-vis -vis these feelings. They, that, that matters much. Okay, so let's have some research questions that may explain uh, these feelings. So the first thing is that, how do traditionally migrant sending countries grapple with the issue of receiving immigrants? As, as you'll hear soon, I, I put both Hungary and Turkey practically within the frame of traditionally migrant sending countries as, as a result of their histories. And the second question that we may ask is, how does the conservative right 
turn migration into a political issue. And hereby I refer to two conservative uh, political parties in Hungary and Turkey, and that is uh, the Alliance of Young Democrats in Hungary and Justice and, Justice and Development Party in Turkey, very popular parties once again. Now, why Hungary and Turkey? I mean, why, can we ha why do we have these countries to respond to, the, to, the, to this research question? Well, numerous kin living abroad, I don't know whether you, come acro you came across ever any people of Turkish or Hungarian uh, background, but uh, just, just in case, example myself, um, no, we live abroad. <laughs> um, in fact, you can say that the Turkish move from the east to west has been continuing because you may know that historically Turks, they started from Central Asia and then eventually they settled in, in Anatolian basin and they're still moving westwards. Um, in, in Hungary, this is pretty much the case as well. I mean, this is very much to do with the political history in both countries, obviously. The Hungarians, they've been through 1956, the Hungarian Revolution, which, 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 which failed, and then communism, etc., uh, which paved the way towards more and more Hungarians settling, gaining asylum and refugee status in the Western countries. Now, there's also a very distinct legacy of multiculturalism and multi multilingualism in these countries. Don't forget that Turkey or Ottoman Empire as such was Canada of 19th century. I mean, it, was a, it was a big multi-ethnic empire that had a lot of ethnicities and different religions that were living together all the way from the Balkans to the Anatolian Peninsula as well as to its east. Once again, Hungary, it was part of the Habsburg Empire. You may know it was called Hung Austro-Hungarian Empire, in fact, which had along with its you know, Hungarian majority in some contexts, Hungarian minority, um, and S Slavs, you know, Romanians, Jews, uh, Roma people, I mean, uh, Germans, and what have you. So both contexts should have had some sort of legacy of multiculturalism. The other thing which is similar in these two contexts is existing immigrants with predominantly similar ethnic and religious traits to those of the host nation. So as I mentioned, even those who come or who've been coming uh, to settle in these, in these countries belong to, you know, in, in the Turkish case, belong to Sunnite Islam. Um, they may not be you know, Turkish ethnics, maybe they were Slavic, but they were for, uh, first and foremost a Muslim. That, that's very important. Or else uh, they belong to the, the, the bigger universe of Turkish speakers per se. Uh, my, my father's family, for example, they left Bulgaria, or let's say they were made to leave Bulgaria in 1946, and my mother's family, they left uh, you know, Greece. But once again, even if you know, they may have had different ethnicities, they all spoke Turkish as their primary language. Um, conservative party politics, once again, which is quite common, that frame immigration as a security issue. Now, what is this? Well, in this case, what we come across is diff being different uh, to be framed as a threat to the security of the nation. And let's see what that means. Now, the case selection, why Hungary, why Turkey, as I mentioned briefly, large immigration, you know, also part of a multi-ethnic empire, uh, Hungary, center of a cosmopolitan empire, Ottoman Empire, and recent immigration uh, to North America at least, or 1960s onwards to Western Europe. Uh, Hungary's small number of migrants, once again, Turkey's small number of migrants. Uh, Hungary has been more appealing destination for its ethnic kin, especially from its neighboring countries. Turkey, historically more appealing for its religious kin, uh, but recently attracted for neighboring nations. This is as a result of the end of the Cold War and Soviet Union falling apart, etc., and hence Central Asians or Caucasian people being more free to, to, to travel to Turkey. In, the case, in, in, the, in both cases, aversion of racial and religious differences, is, it's quite acute in Hungary, but aversion of religious difference has been quite acute in Turkey, and all these considerations practically determine uh, the public feeling towards immigrants. Now, why two conservative parties? No, Fidesz is the strongest conservative, it has the strongest conservative party mandate in the EU. It, it controls two thirds of, of, of Hungarian parliament. You, I'm not sure how, how familiar you are with parliamentary systems, but this, this means quite, quite a lot. I mean, they, they can change the constitution. In fact, they wrote a new constitution and they introduced a, con a new constitution right away after they won the elections. 
AKP or Just, Justice and Development Party, it, ha it is the most successful conservative party in Europe since 2002. So both of these parties, they deserve our attention in order to see how they negotiate their way around migration. Um, they both profit from an aversion of you know, foreignness. In the first case though, uh, they, not only that they profit, but, on, but also Fidesz, they stimulate this aversion of foreignness. It, 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 it is very much expressive in terms of their policies against, against Europe, for example, uh, the way uh, how the, 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 the politicians in Hungary framed the economic crisis in Europe, and the way how they framed uh, you know, European Union demands from Hungary as somehow demands of, of a foreign, let's say, power. Um, in, in the Turkish case, though, the, 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 the main conservative party, it profits from an aversion of religious foreignness, which means that you know, it is an attempt to establish almost like a monolithic uh, religious identity in the Turkish case, which shouldn't have been the case as uh, you know, it is a secular republic. Now, in this case, immigration in both, according to both parties, appears as a threat to the homogeneity of the nation. Um, and in, in the Hungarian case, this is in, in the context of a stagnating population as well. I mean, you may think that, well, if population is stagnating, maybe they, would, they need to have immigrants. But in the Turkish case, despite an increasing population, still immigration is considered as a threat. Um, finally, in the Turkish case, there's tolerance for illegal immigration, meaning that as long as the immigrants, they don't claim you know, residency rights, social rights, etc., we can have them and we can somehow integrate them into the informal economy, which is very big in Turkey. Now let's see some public opinion surveys. This is extremely interesting, especially look at the first one. Now in Hungary, more than 80% of respondents to a survey refused to receive Arabs, Chinese, Russians, etc. But also 68% refused a non-existent group called Pires. <laughs> I mean, these people, they don't really exist, but still 68%, they refused to have these people. I mean, if, if the name is foreign, cross it out. <laughs> right. In, the, in Turkey, 81% of respondents, they stated that the number of immigrants to Turkey increased during the past five years, which is not the case as we look at the statistics, but somehow the public opinion feels that way. And 45% conceded that immigration was bad for the country, even if there are not many immigrants. And only 6% believe that this, this was a positive phenomenon. It's a very recent 2011 survey. Now let's see some speeches to see how politicians have been framing uh, their immigration policies and how they've been cashing on uh, uh, from uh, the public opinion. Now, Hungary, was, Hungary carried out the EU presidency in 2011. It was a um, rather difficult presidency for Hungary, but they were there for six months. And this is one of the speeches uh, from Hungarian Prime Minister during uh, one of, I think it, it was the closing uh, meeting of the EU presidency. Now, if there are not adequate children, then only immigration can be a solution. This is very much based on stagnation in Hungarian population growth. In this case, the natural balance of the society will be upset. You know, natural balance is quite interesting here. For the long-term harmony and peaceful operation of, of our society, it's important that the communities can maintain themselves without the involvement of external forces. So in a way, you know, the prime minister is putting all the burden on Hungarian people so that Hungarians can avoid receiving foreigners. Europe cannot build its future based on immigration instead of families because those that expect help from others sooner or later would pay the price of that help. I mean, this is something quite extraordinary to say, um, and I don't know how true it is. Now, the Prime Minister of Turkey, I mean, um, he's, he's increasing the concern about the Turkish population growth as well. Not that the Turkish population growth is, in is, is decreasing, but at least it is stagnating. Now, there are 170,000 Armenians living in Turkey, 70,000 are Turkish citizens. We're turning a blind eye to the remaining 100,000. Now, these are the, the Armenian citizens, citizens of the Republic of Armenia that are working in Turkey in the informal sector. Tomorrow I may tell these 100,000 to go back to their country if it becomes necessary. Now this is very, very vague as well. We don't really know what would make this thing necessary, but no, it's, it is still there. Um, an interviewee for Eurosphere Turkey project, this was a project uh, which carried out you know, 
opinion surveys on immigration in different European countries says that if one accepts everyone like migrants coming from Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, India, or China, just see that you know, these, all, all of these countries are to, to, the, to the east of Turkey, right? I mean, he d the interview does not say anything about Bosnians or Kosovo or Albanians or any other Westerners, let's say, who've been settling in Turkey during their retirement. That would bring chaos to Turkey. You know? it, chaos is, once again, a very, very big word. It's normal that the Turkey state makes its own decisions as to whom it accepts or rejects. Now, here we go. Now, the Armenians are here, all right, and the prime minister says that he can tell these people to go back to their country, and then you see in the public opinion a survey, someone says it is normal that the Turkish state makes its own decisions. Right. Now, conclusion. Okay, Th there are two different elements of why you know, these societies have been feeling themselves rather uncomfortable with you know, immigrants posing a certain difference. There's an internal element to that, and that is despite being major immigrants, both Turkey and Hungary, and having multi-ethnic historical legacies, uh, nations can react to religious and racial differences of immigrants. This is very much to do with you know, the internal feelings of homogeneity in these countries. And the external uh, element is, despite small number of immigrants and their composition similar to the receiving nations, Immigrants still, sorry, there's a uh, small typo there. Immigrants still foster aversive public attitudes. And this is pretty much it, you know, in the absence of immigrants that we can still have, you know, uh, policies or public opinions that may question the, the position of immigrants in very, very much homogeneous societies. Thank you very much. Chipman, um, what role does um, the Kurdish population in this area play in the fears of immigration, especially in Turkey, but mm -hmm. also in that area of the world with Iraq and Iran and such? Shall I gather all questions or? Take them one at a time. Yes, okay. Um, the Kurdish population of Turkey is around 13% of Turkish population. Um, there are also overlaps between Kurdish and Turkish families because we're talking about mixed families as well. Um, they are part of you know, the Turkish state per se, but it's very, very recent that the Turkish, Turkish state came to recognize the difference, the ethnic difference of, of Kurds. Uh, in the 90s, Kurdish immigration, especially from Iraq, uh, has been a was a very big issue, and neither the Turkish public opinion nor the Turkish state was there to accept Kurd, you know, Kurd, Kurdish refugees running away from, from uh, the turmoil in Iraq, especially during uh, you know, Saddam Hussein's uh, political period there. Now, there's one thing which I didn't really go into detail, and you also have to make a note of it, is the Turkish asylum regime does not accept any asylum seekers from east of Turkey. Uh, there are only four countries in the world. That's the first one is Monaco. I don't know who goes there to ask asylum. Maybe the Russians, the oligarchs, who knows? Madagascar and Congo, along with Turkey, these are the only four remaining countries in the world that that have a geographical criteria in terms of accepting, you know, asylum seekers. Which means to, which means that anyone like um, an Iraqi Kurd or Iraqi person or a Syrian refugee can all, can only be or Iranian can only be temporal in Turkey, right? So as long as this doesn't really change, I mean, regardless of your place of coming, as long as you, you're from the East, you may be an Iraqi Kurd, but you won't be really welcome. Thank you. Mark. My name is Liza Campbell. Um, I spent some time living in Bulgaria and okay. was really interested in the way um, public attitudes towards minorities were really different from sort of the way I've been taught in the States to talk and look at minorities. Um, and I was really interested especially in the Roma people there mm -hmm. and um, sort of like you've laid out how this framework of, I don't know, um, really sensitive marginality politics oh. impacted people's views. 
And so my question is, um, so as this becomes a reality for more and more countries in the Balkans and in Eastern Europe and in other places, um, and in Turkey as well, how will that impact public policies that have to be made for things like building schools or for having minority political parties or what policies are changing in response to these movements? Uh, in response to Roma people or minorities? Minorities such? in general. All right, in Turkey, a lot has changed, in fact. I mean, the Turkish minority regime has only accepted you know, Jews, Armenians, and Greeks as the three minorities in Turkey since 1920s. But um, although the Kurds have not really received a minority status, uh, as they are considered to be you know, an aspect of, of Turkish state, um, recently, uh, teaching in Kurdish language has been introduced, and Turkish alphabet also accepted the three uh, letters that the Kurdish had in their alphabet, so all of a sudden, rather than 29, we have 32 letters in the Turkish alphabet. Um, but the state that still does not really deliver Kurdish teaching or uh, teaching in Kurdish medium in Turkey, it's only in a private schooling uh, which would provide this. Now, the question is that, in this case, everyone, regardless of you being an Armenian Kurd, you no know, Turkish ethnic, you're all paying your tax to the state. But why does it have to be that uh, Kurdish should be taught privately if all these people are, t are paying their taxes to the Turkish state. So the mentality has been changing, all right, but in terms of the minority language education or minority education, with the exception of the Armenians and Greeks and, and, and Jews, we cannot talk about you know, Kurdish being an organic part of uh, Turkey yet. Thanks. So my name is Nathan Kander, and um, I was wondering about integration with the rest of Europe? Because, I mean, Hungary and Turkey have both been integrating a lot more economically and politically with Europe. I mean, Hungary is part of the Schengen Zone now, and Turkey is making a lot of efforts to be more connected with the EU. Um, has there been much pressure from the EU to uh, sort of get them to change their stance on immigration? And if there has been, has it, why has it not been as effective as it could have been? Uh, there is a lot of pressure on Turkey, in fact, as a result of what I mentioned as this, you know, the geographical limitation on the, on the asylum seekers and their acceptance in Turkey. Um, well, Turkey is recently signing um, an agreement to accept uh, third country refugees that pass through Turkey to, to, the, to the European Union. Uh, so far, Turkey did not accept to receive these people back. Uh, but it is recently being signed, I think it's 16th of December, that now Turkey is going to accept third country nationals that use its, its territory to reach you know, Greece or Bulgaria. Uh, and then Turkey will have to you know, keep these people in its, in its own soil. Um, uh, well, I came across this in, in Hungary as well. And the Hungarians, some in, in some interviews, police officers, they were talking about the fact that Hungary also had this geographical limitation. And Hungary only changed the geographical limitation once it received a direct signal that Hungary is going to become an EU country. The Turkish officials, though, or the Turkish government did not really want to change the geographical limitation before the, the, Tur the Turkish government was sure that Turkey was going to be an EU country because otherwise you just end up to be you know, some sort of buffer zone where you know, third country nationals may use uh, to remain while you know, their uh, asylum applications in the West may fail. But um, to an extent that the Turkey gets uh, much and much closer to EU membership, I believe that the feeling towards these third country nationals will also change. It also brings quite a lot of um, responsibilities on Turkey because at the moment, I think with the exception of, of sub-Saharan sub Africans or Southeast Asians, anyone can enter Turkey without, it's very, very easy to enter Turkey without any visas. Uh, but yes, there is a lot of pressure from, from EU, but Turkey has been using this in a way, you know, um, uh, um, in order to show itself well, we can be important you know, mm -hmm. for, the, for the future of Europe and we can perhaps protect it from uh, illegal migration. Okay. Thank okay. you. Hi, uh, my name is Nick Mason. I'm a professor of English and European studies. Mm. Um, there's kind of a, you're probably familiar living in Britain, there's sort of the old joke about the uh, anti-immigrant immigration person in Britain uh, saying, you know, if we get any more foreigners, I'm going to have to move to Spain. Um, 
And I, I wonder if there's a sort of, is, is there any of that with the, the large Turkish population in Germany? Do you see many immigrants from Germany, uh, either Turks or native Germans or, you know, ethnic Germans, um, moving to Istanbul or elsewhere? Or mm. is, there, is there grown much of a community that way? Yeah, certainly. There, well, I mean, it, it's been there, I think, since the 80s, uh, especially the Turkish coast has been quite attractive for you know, the Scandinavians, the West Europeans, etc., for their retirement. And Turkey also has started health tourism to, to deliver long-term health care uh, for the elderly, especially from uh, Western Europe. I mean, the numbers are, are not comparable, obviously. You cannot really compare around 2 million Turkish citizens who are living in Germany to, let's say, a couple of you know, tens of thousands of Germans or West Europeans who settled at the Turkish coast. But when AK AKP is yeah. uh, you know, carrying on about the immigration problem, they don't necessarily include the retirees in that group? I mean, the number is very, very small uh, to talk about, but uh, I think there's an active policy to, to turn Turkey in a way to deliver you know, services or a safe home during retirement, uh, because these people, you know, they're richer and they would invest in Turkey, they would buy property and et cetera, they would pay for services. But this, I don't think that this really turns into something of a, of a policy yet. But every now and then, though, um, you hear, you know, Turkish politicians who are quite pro-EU accession saying that Turkey can serve as retirement homes, etc., in the future for the, the elderly in, in Western Europe. I mean, you hear that, but it's not a policy yet. Having said that, I mean, there's one more thing, in fact, uh, to respond to your question. Uh, since the economic crisis in Greece, uh, in fact, uh, Turkish politicians, once again, have been quite vocal uh, in terms of attracting the Greeks who were Turkish citizens, but who were made to leave over years to get to somehow get them back to Turkey. I mean, this is still in, in rhetorics. Uh, but very recently, you know, a couple of different government ministers have been talking about the Greeks as well as Armenians who were made to leave in Turkey in the 60s, 70s, 80s, etc., and the fact that they should also have a right to return, especially during the economic crisis that uh, Greece has been facing. Um, I'm Sam Perryman. I'm a political science major, mm -hmm. and my question was, what efforts has the Turkish government been making to legitimize the uh, anti-immigration policies when the state's official claim is that there is no racism in Turkey? Well, I mean, there is no racism in Turkey dates back to not only, you know, recent AKP or Just and Development uh, Party policies, but it's built on this whole idea that the Ottoman Empire has been this very, very tolerant multi-ethnic empire. And you know the Turkish nation have something to be proud of in terms of its multi-religious composition, multi-ethnic composition, etc. And based on that, I suppose the Republican uh, politicians have carried on this. You no, know, there is no racism in in Turkey per se. Um, but I mean, there is really first of all, there is no education for anti-racism in Turkish schools. I mean, th th this is something that you really see. Uh, in Western w Western Europe, that um, their schools would would grasp, you know, this equality, education, anti-racism education, but the Turkish pupils they are not really aware of um, anti-racism uh, in terms of its in terms of their education medium. The other thing is that there's also internal racism in Turkey, such jokes about different ethnicities, people from you know, Black Sea coast, especially very, very funny jokes. I don't think that the people from that region certainly think that this is funny, but the general population in Turkey, the one joke after another, you would really hear these things. Now, these jokes existed all, all the way through. I mean, there were jokes in the 40s and 50s against the Jews, for example, which sounded funny probably for the majority, but probably they did not really found all that funny for the minority. And people, they don't really realize that uh, this is racist. So, you know, quite a few things that you would consider as racist in North American context, do not really register as racist in in Hungary or Turkey, you know, because these countries they are not really used to uh, anti-racism policies. Thank you. Okay. Merhaba. Merhaba. Uh, my name is Garrett Allen. Right. I'm uh, majoring in Middle e uh, 
international relations, minoring Middle Eastern mm -hmm. studies, and I'm planning um, to do a study abroad in Turkey this summer. Okay. Um, how difficult, you talked a lot about the immigration policies, how difficult is it to receive a, or to obtain a visa for Turkey? I think it, for education, mm -hmm. for, I, I think it's pretty straightforward. I mean, Turkish government, once again, has been investing quite a lot to lure foreign uh, students coming either to, to learn Turkish uh, or else you know, to follow um, education in Turkey, uh, graduate education, undergraduate education, etc., just to keep the Turkish uh, state and private uh, university education going. So I'd imagine that obviously it's bureaucracy. You have to bring this and that quite a few papers, but it would be quite straightforward. So would you say in terms of education that there isn't a bias towards immigrants or towards no, people No, in fact, there? Uh, in fact I, I'd imagine that um, in terms of education, since the, the foreigners, they will be paying more than Turkish citizens, you know, they would be more welcome. Um, but just to, just to be there during their education, I don't think anyone really thinks, let's say an American would really remain in Turkey and would look for a job in Turkey after uh, right. they go to of university. Course. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you. We've had most questions about Turkey, so I'll ask one yeah. about Hungary. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, when Fidesz was in power, before, they often talked as if they had a right to speak on behalf of Hungarians who lived in Slovakia mm. or Romania. Um, as the, to what extent has the party continued to maintain that, uh, the idea that the Hungarian foreign ministry speaks for more Hungarians than our citizens of the state of Hungary? And is that, a, is that something that the rest of Europe has gotten more comfortable with than they were when they started doing this 15 years ago? I mean, Fidesz's domestic policies as well as their external policies has been always based on this the mythical Carpathian Basin. Carpathian Basin is the area where Hungarians settled more than a thousand years ago, and Fidesz claims itself to be the, the representative of the nation. And nation, according to Hungarian language, is not necessarily those who are Hungarian citizens, but those who come or who claim themselves at least to be hung Hungarian. And they have, um, they may not. Uh, have to be only in the Carpathian Basin as well in North America. If you're Hungarian ethnic, then you belong to the Hungarian nation. Now, in in the 1990s, the Hungarian politicians they were they were trying to use this card more explicitly, more blatantly towards their you know neighboring uh, the, their neighbors or towards Europe. I mean, the, Hung the first Hungarian prime minister after the transition to democracy. He said that he's the, he's the prime minister of 15 million Hungarians, even if the Hungarian population is 10 million uh, living in, in Hungary. But I think um, very much may change uh, during the European Parliament elections, which is coming next year, uh, because for the first, uh, and as well as the Hungarian national elections, in the second one, for the first time, the Hungarian ethnics who recently became Hungarian citizens will be allowed to vote. And they will also elect you know, MPs at, at the Hungarian parliament. So all of a sudden, the Hungarian parliament sitting in Budapest will be representative of you know, Hungarians in Romania, Hungarians in Slovakia, etc. So then perhaps these claims will gain more legitimacy. But towards that, Fidesz has already been consolidating itself, in, especially in, in Transylvania. Uh, Slovakia is a bit more you know, catchy because the, Slovaks, the Slovak government is not very comfortable with these policies while you know through divide and rule like if there's a hungarian romanian party then let's divide the, the part the, the, the partners to this which will be pro profides and then let's exclude those who are not profides from the concept of the nation right so they've been establishing themselves and we will see what will come up uh, in the elections next year but in brussels i don't really know uh, to what extent they use this card Hi, uh, my name is Quinn Meek. I'm in the Department of Political Science. Thanks for, for joining us. Uh, two questions. The f first has to do a little bit with what you hope to get out of this comparison uh, between Hungary and Turkey. Mm. You highlighted a number of similarities uh, and control, for, uh, control variables, essentially, of why it's useful to look at these two countries together. I'm wondering uh, what, in particular, um, what, what leverage the comparison gives you in understanding uh, this particular type of country, this particular type of anti-immigration uh, party, um, and, and what variations you, you do see, right? What, what they can teach uh, us in terms of the variations that they have. So that, that's question number one. 
Uh, question number two has to do more with some of the empirics on the, the Turkish side. Mm. We saw this remarkable evolution of Turkish foreign policy, particularly in the second term of, of the AKP uh, with Davutoglu and, and his, his very proactive foreign policy in, in reaching out to neighbors uh, all around Turkey. And I'm wondering to what extent uh, immigration policy was thought of as a tool of foreign policy or as a, as a way of supporting that very uh, expansive foreign policy that, that uh, Turkey began to take on in the second term of, of the AK, AKP's power. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you highlighted a little bit around the, the Armenians, the number of Armenians, and I'm wondering how much in pop popular perception is this really an Armenian issue? Or when people think about immigrants to Turkey, really who are they thinking about? Uh, and if there's any difference between the AKP's perspective as, as uh, a as moderate Islamist party to the MHP's perspective, for example, as a mm -hmm. very ethnic Turkish nationalist party. I, I know that uh, there's been a, an extensive outreach to Turkic peoples in the east, right, with bringing a lot of, uh, of Uzbeks and Turkmen and, and others into Turkey to study, for example. And I'm just wondering to what extent there, there's this ethnification uh, of immigration policy as well. Okay, thank you. Quite a lot of questions there. I hope I will remember. Um, well, let's start from double toll. I mean, I, I believe Turkish foreign policy is a total disaster. It's been one failure after another. Imagine Turkey does not have any ambassadors left in, in Cairo, in Tel Aviv. Uh, what was the third one? Yeah, and in Yerevan, uh, to its even. These are really important uh, neighbors to Turkey, and as a result of AKP's you know, no problem with neighbors' policy, we have lots of problems with Turkey's neighbors at the moment. Um, however, increasingly, you know, since, well, since, the, since the beginning of the Syrian crisis, the Syrian refugees in Turkey ha uh, have been used by AKP in a way to raise attention to the Syrian drama and perhaps to, to get the Western countries to intervene in Syria. I mean, in the beginning, AKP was really, really vocal. Now they, the prime minister invited Davutol invited Syrian refugees, as long as they're temporal, obviously, to Turkey so that they can show to the West, look, there are all these millions of people who are running away from you know, the turmoil and, and the civil war, et cetera. We, you have to do something about this thing. But it failed. I mean, at the moment, I think around a million or so Syrians who are in limbo, they can never really become permanent in Turkey. And you know, some of them, they've been living there for years now, and they have no place to go back either. And AKP could not really gain any, any leverage uh, with its uh, Western allies to intervene in, in Syria. So in a way, you know, AKP has, has tried to use these people as a foreign policy tool, maybe very, very pragmatic, but it failed. And this is something that I'm going to look more. In fact, I received a grant from Carnegie Foundation recently to look into how Turkish uh, asylum regime has been pragmatically manipulated by AKP with respect to the Syrian refugee crisis. Now, the other thing is about MHP. I don't think that MHP has any policies whatsoever against uh, migrants. But, I mean, they, their only policy position ever has been Kurds. They don't have anything to say about the economy. They have nothing to say about the EU. They have nothing to say about foreign policy. But it's a party that only defines itself vis-a-vis uh, -vis, vis -vis the Kurds. So I haven't really come across anything from MHP to tell the truth. Um, but JHP, you know, the Republican People's Party, which became more and more lefty and socialist over years, uh, in this Eurosphere project, uh, you see that their voters are a bit more welcoming uh, towards differences. But we cannot say that, I mean, the typical JHP voter would be welcoming to Kurds either. So they're still aversive of differences. Um, so, it, I mean, they don't really have a very, very you know, visible uh, position there. Um, what is the typical foreigner in Turkey? I mean, I suppose more and more the typical foreigner in Turkey is uh, a Moldovan or a Georgian or an Azeri or a Central Asian domestic worker. Um, very much so in the informal economy, but also increasingly being formalized uh, caretakers uh, who are cohabiting with Turkish families who can never stay more than six months. Uh, they have to renew their residence permits every six months, etc. And this is becoming to be a typical foreigner uh, for a 
for, for Turks. But at the same time, Syrians will become a typical foreigner uh, because if you have one million or so Syrians there, eventually Turkish population will have to come to accept the presence of one million. It's very big. But at the same time, th there, sh there are around two million or so Iranians in transit in Turkey, right? None of them are permanent once again, but they don't really feature uh, in any public debate. And in any case, the, pu the Turkish public opinion looking at these Iranians is if they're running away from their countries, they must have done something wrong. So they can't really accept the fact that you know, these people are coming out of despair. Now, what brings these two countries together and what's my interest in looking at them? I mean, okay, uh, I, I'm fluent both in Turkish and Hungarian, obviously. I can read uh, sources in both languages, but also the developing shape of uh, conservatism in these countries is quite unique. Um, the way the Turkish and Hungarian politicians are using religion, for example, the way they are giving references to Tur Turkish or Hungarian eth ethnicity, and increasingly the way these two societies are defining themselves vis-a-vis -vis and in relationship to their east. Um, I mean, these two countries have been these two societies have been rather convergent in the 1930s with respect to how they straight themselves linked to the East, but part of the West. And increasingly, these two uh, countries are looking more towards their East and further, maybe some mythical East per se, but building their nationality on the base of their Eastern links. And it can, they may be mythical. I mean, I don't, I don't think that anyone in Turkey still claim that they, they came from Central Asia and longer. In any case, we don't really have slanted eyes and longer, and we change that. And we're, in fact, ethnically, the Turks they are the closest Armenians, if you do any DNA search, um, according to some Italian uh, you know, studies. Um, but mythically, it is still there. And Turkish conservatism and Hungarian conservatism is, is, is very, very much uh, related to religion, Eastern links, and uh, ethnicity, the mythical composition of ethnicity. So that's why I think they deserve an attention. Okay, thanks. Thank you.